Today's lesson is all about data integrity and how we can use data validation and data verification methods to protect the integrity of data. We're going to be looking at the uses of data validation, including range check, length check, format check, presence check, existence check, limit check, and check digit. We're also going to be able to describe and use methods of data verification during the data entry process and during data transfer. Most of these are going to be a recap of concepts studied at IGCSE, so let's begin with some key terms. Of course, you need to understand what data integrity means. It's the accuracy, completeness, and consistency of data. It's a very important key term, so make sure you jot this down. Of course, validation and verification, you should be familiar with these from previous work. However, if you're not sure, pause the video and get these definitions down. Check digit is an additional digit appended to a number to check if the entered data is error free. We can use modulo 11, a method that is used to calculate a check digit based on modulus division by 11. Similarly, you can have checksum, which is actually a verification method used to check if data transferred has been altered or corrupted. And this is calculated from the block of data that is to be sent. So you use this block of data, you create the checksum, and then you send it out. The receiver does the same calculation. And if the checksum matches, then the data is verified to be correct. And similarly, you have parity bits and parity checks, which check if the data has been transferred correctly through the use of even or odd parity. And odd parity basically means you count the number of ones. And if the binary number has an odd number of one bits, it's odd parity. And if it has an even number of one bits, that's even parity. We can also use a parity byte and a parity block to do some additional checking. And we'll be looking at this in a bit more detail later. And the final bit is ARQs or automatic repeat requests, which is a type of verification check using acknowledgements and timeouts as mechanisms to ensure that data integrity is maintained. So do pause the video to jot these definitions down and we'll begin by looking at data accuracy. Now data accuracy involves storing data on a computer to ensure that it is consistent and up to date and of course accurate. Two of the methods used to ensure data integrity are validation and verification. The accuracy or integrity of the data can be compromised in a number of different ways. For example, during the data entry and during data transmission stages. It can be compromised by malicious attacks on the data, for example, caused by malware and hacking, and by accidental data loss caused through hardware issues or through human error. All of these factors can ensure that the data that you're about to enter or transmit isn't as accurate as it should be. So let's look at validation first. Data validation is a method of checking if entered data is reasonable and within a given criteria, but it cannot check if data is correct or accurate. An example could be that when you're entering colors, brown is an acceptable value. But if the person actually likes blue and you have entered brown, that is inaccurate. So it just checks if the data is reasonable, but it doesn't check for full accuracy. It's very difficult to do that. Validation is normally carried out by computer software itself. And there are a number of different validation types, and some of those are on screen, so I would suggest you pause the video and go through each one in detail. Now, most of these should be very familiar if you've been working with computers before. For example, type checks, length checks, range checks, these are pretty common. Present checks, especially when you're online and you have to enter important data. If you leave a field blank, the computer doesn't accept that. That's present check. Length check checks whether the data has the required number of characters especially think about passwords. Format check checks whether data has been entered in the agreed format, like date, date, month, month, year, year, that kind of data. Postcode is another example, which uses format checks. Range checks ensures data is within a agreed upper and lower bound limit. For example, entering someone's age, zero to 100 probably is a reasonable range. And then, of course, you've got type check, which checks if data input is of the right type. For example, entering text data into a numeric integer field, that can cause an issue. Or maybe typing real numbers in an integer field. That can cause issues as well with the accuracy of data because the decimal part can be cut off. And then you have existence checks, which checks if data is in a file or it actually exists 
and then there is the limit check it checks only one of the limits such as the upper limit or the lower limit of an age so it's an extension of that range check you've got consistency check which checks whether data in two or more fields match up correctly think about when you've got a field which say enter your title and you entered misses and then you've got a gender field where you enter male so that means that data is inconsistent because it should be mr and male and not mrs and male or miss and male so consistency check checks whether data in two or more fields actually matches up correctly it doesn't check that individual field for accuracy it checks across two fields and finally you have uniqueness check which checks that each entered value is unique and it can be very useful when you're dealing with id numbers or bank account numbers and so forth now if you pause the video and go through the validation tests on the screen you'll be able to see examples of data failing validation tests and passing validation tests so make sure that for each validation test you know what it is and you can give examples of failure and success for each one now verification is another way of preventing errors when data is entered manually especially using a keyboard or when data is transferred from one computer to another verification during data entry involves entering the data manually into a computer and going through a verification check to ensure that there are no errors in place for example when you are typing in blue and brown think back to that color example again if the person liked blue and you entered brown you can verify that by visually checking it which means that entered data is compared with the original documents in other words what is on screen is compared to data on the original paper document or you can use double entry where data is entered twice using two different people and then compared now double entry doesn't really mean at AS level that you, the same person is entering the data twice because the same person can make the mistake so you you've got two people doing it or two operators entering the data and then the data is compared to ensure that it is entered correctly now there are other mechanisms to check data and check digits is quite common the check digit is an additional digit added to a number usually in the rightmost position they are often used in barcodes ISBN numbers and vehicle identification numbers the check digit can be used to ensure that the barcode for example has been correctly inputted the check digit can catch errors including an incorrect digit being entered such as 8190 instead of 8180 a transposition error where two numbers have been swapped such as 8108 instead of 8180 it can also pick up digits being omitted or added such as 818 or 81180 instead of 8180 and phonetic errors can also be picked up such as 13 instead of 30 because they sound the same now you would need to know how to work out a check digits and the most common algorithm used is modulo 11 so pause the video and go through the example of how a check digit calculation using modulo 11 actually works now the algorithm works as follows each digit in the original number is given a weighting one two three four five six seven you normally start from the right hand side and give it the least weighting so the rightmost digit will have the weighting of one and the leftmost digit will have the highest number but some people can also start from the left with writing the highest number and then working in descending order whichever way you use it it's exactly the same the digit is then multiplied by its weighting and then each value is added to make a total this total is divided by 11 and the remainder subtracted from 11 the check digit is that value generated and if the check digit is 10 then x is used otherwise you use whatever digit is left now on screen you see an example you've got a seven digit number 4156710 we give it the weighing value 7654321 we then simply multiply them with the value 7 times 4 6 times 1 5 times 5 and so forth add them all up together it gives us 106 we divide the total by 11 which gives us 9 remainder 7 and we take that 7 and subtract it from the original 11 which now gives us 4 as the check digit now the computer this data is entered into also runs the calculation and it checks the rightmost bit and if the number matches 4 then it accepts the data as being accurate otherwise it rejects it now how do we verify that data sent from one computer to another is actually correct 
when data is transferred electronically from one device to another, there's always the possibility of data corruption or even data loss. A number of ways exist to minimize this particular risk, and the one we're interested in now is checksum. A checksum is a method to check if data has been changed or corrupted following data transmission. Data is sent in blocks, and an additional value, the checksum, is sent at the end of the block of data. Now we're going to assume that the checksum of a block of data is one byte in length. This basically means that we have a maximum value of 2 to the power of 8 and you take away 1. So 0 to 255 are possible values. The 0 value is ignored and if we sum all the bytes in the transmitted block of data and it's less than or equal to 255 then the checksum becomes that value. However, if the sum of all the bytes in the block is greater than 255 then the checksum is found using this algorithm. So we take the number and divide the sum x which is the total of the block of bytes by 256 because 2 to the power 8 is 256. We round the answer down to the nearest whole number. So in this case 1185 divided by 256 is equals 4.629. We round it down to the nearest whole number which gives y equals 4. We then multiply this number by 256, 2 to the power 8 remember, and then we calculate the difference between the original number and this number. So 256 times 4 is 1024. We subtract this number from the original, so 1185 minus 1024, which gives us 161. And since this number is less than 255, this number becomes the checksum value. So it's a clever way of taking big totals and reducing them down to fit into one byte. Now another method to check if data is not corrupted or changed following transmission is parity check. A byte of data is allocated a parity bit, and this is allocated before transmission. So before transmission, both computer systems will decide on the type of parity to use and in this case let's just say if the systems decide to use an even parity then the data is checked by the sender and the number of ones in that particular byte are counted and if the number of ones are odd then an extra one is added for the parity bit if they're even then you just add a zero for the parity bit because you want to maintain an even number of ones and similarly, if you're choosing odd parity, you want to count the number of ones. And if they are an odd number of ones, then you make the parity bit zero. If they are even number of ones, then you add an extra one to make the total number of ones odd. Now, if a byte has been transmitted from computer A to computer B and even parity is used, an error would be flagged up if the byte now had an odd number of one bits at the receiver's end. Now the parity bit is normally appended on the left hand side at AS level so make sure that you're familiar with that particular format. Even though an error has been flagged using parity bit checks, it's impossible to know exactly which bit is in error. A way around this is to use a parity block. A block of data is sent and the number of bits are totaled horizontally and vertically. In other words, you do a parity check both in a horizontal and vertical direction. So on screen you see this example where you got nine bytes being transmitted. The first column is the parity bit and then the remainder is the data. This particular method that we're going to talk about not only identifies that an error has occurred but also indicates where the error is. So the nine bytes of data that have been transmitted in the example on screen, the agreement has been made that even parity will be used. Another byte known as the parity byte has also been sent. This byte is sent at the end, so this is the 10th byte, and it consists entirely of bits produced by a vertical parity check. So the parity bit for each byte will check that particular byte, but if you check each column vertically, then to ensure that that has an even number of ones, you create a parity byte which will consist all of those bits. So let's check how it works. Go through each byte line by line and check if they have an even number of ones. You should eventually find out that byte 8 has three ones, so there's a problem there. Now if you go and check each column, you'll also find that bit 5 has an issue because you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in that particular column. So we can narrow it down to bit 5 in byte 8 as the problem and that's where the error lies. So it's a clever little way of identifying individual bits. Of course, there is a major problem with this, that what happens if two bits have an error? And that's the parity problem. 
If two of the bits change value during data transmission, it may be impossible to locate the error using these particular methods. And that's why we need to use other methods to complement parity checks when it comes to error checking of transmitted data. No way around this one, I'm afraid. Now, the final one we're going to look at is an automatic repeat request or ARQ, which is another method to check data following data transmission. And this method can be summarized as follows. ARQ uses acknowledgement, which means a message sent to the receiver indicating that data has been received correctly, and a timeout, which is the time interval allowed to elapse before an acknowledgement is received. Now, when the receiving device detects an error following data transmission, it asks for the data packets to be resent. And if no error is detected, a positive acknowledgement is sent to the sender. The sending device will resend the data package in the following situations. If it receives a request to resend the data or a timeout has occurred and it hasn't received any positive or negative acknowledgement. The whole process is continuous until the data packet received is correct or until the ARQ time limit or a timeout is actually reached. ARQ is often used by mobile phone networks to guarantee data integrity and it's actually used more often than you might think. Now that's the end of the lesson for today. You should be able to identify common validation types. You should be able to talk about common verification methods. You should understand how Modulo 11 works, how the checksum algorithm works itself, how do parity blocks work, and how to identify bit errors and the parity bit problem. So understanding of both parity bits and parity block is essential. And finally, you should be able to explain how ARQ works. In addition to this, you should also be able to give examples of the correct type of validation data and what type of data can actually fail a validation check. So an in-depth understanding of validation types is crucial. That's all for today. If you do have any questions, please do get back to me. Otherwise, I will see you in the next lesson.